Um, hello, my name is Louise Kennedy and I am going to talk to you a wee bit about um, writing dialogue in short stories. Um, I uh, have given workshops in the past and found that a lot of writers really don't like writing dialogue. Uh, some people do, uh, a lot of writers don't like it. I absolutely love it um, and I find it very easy. It's one of the few bits of aspects of writing that I do find easy and um, to the extent that I have to like stop myself from writing like big long passages of um, of of, uh, of dialogue. Um, um, I think part of the reason that I that I love it is um, is because of my background. So I grew up in the north of Ireland in the 1970s. And when I was 12, at the very end of the 70s, we moved from the north to the south. Um, and um, which meant that we we went from a place where we spoke the same as all of our neighbours and everybody we knew um, to a place where we spoke completely differently. My family spoke differently from, from all of the people uh, around us. Um, and I suppose um, it wasn't just the accent that was um, different. That was a very obvious thing and it certainly was different. Um, but I noticed other things um, that just made it a little bit harder to communicate um, or understand or that I had to like listen harder. Um, so one thing would have been that in school, the girls um, had different cultural reference points for me. They, you know, grown up watching different TV programmes and um, uh, they may possibly read different books from the ones that I read. Um, the other thing that was different was that um, we had a different vocabulary. Um, um, we used words in speech like clart and hallion um, and scundered. Um, uh, and these are words that I now know um, are Ulster Scots words, um, but I wouldn't have known that at the time. Um, and I even found that sometimes the uh, syntax of the sentences that I heard being spoken around me sounded um, a wee bit off or different. Um, now, I'm not saying that, uh, that it was off or different, I have to be very diplomatic here, um, but um, it certainly sounded strange uh, to me and it meant that I had to listen quite hard. Um, and I suppose because of that, um, I uh, find myself um, very interested in the way, not, not, not just in what people say, but in the way that they say things. Um, and, you know, um, like a, a, another aspect of this is that I don't speak the way that I did when I was a child. Um, uh, my accent has modified, it's just kind of softened a lot. So, um, I mean, it's probably a Southern accent um, at this stage. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I guess my interest in how people speak probably comes out of a place of, of, of alienation. But I think for the purposes of writing has probably served me quite well um, and um, you know maybe it's not a bad thing to be an outsider um, and, and just to, to listen. Anyway enough about me. Um, when I started trying to write uh, short stories in the beginning um, I suppose I learned from making a lot of mistakes which I'm still making um, and also from reading uh, short stories. Um, and there are some writers who I think are brilliant at writing um, dialogue. So I'll maybe talk a wee bit about some of them and read a few little excerpts. Um, so the first writer I want to talk about is Flannery O'Connor. And um, um, so this story, you very possibly have read it. I'm sure you have read it. If you haven't read it again, maybe, and just have a look at this thing. Maybe you noticed it yourself, maybe you didn't. Um, um, I say that for all of the stories. Um, if you haven't read them, probably do, because it's not just the dialogue that's excellent. You know, they're very excellent stories anyway. Um, so the story of hers that I'm going to talk about is, um, it's called A Good Man is Hard to Find. And it's a story of a family who go on, uh, a family who go on a road trip and they bring their granny along. And the granny is this um, very uptight, nervous, um, wee woman and she um is all done up she's all dicking up in her sunday best and she's put on this kind of ridiculous looking hat and um she's um very concerned that wherever they go that people will see her as respectable um and um she's also worried about um about something that she's just read that she reads in the newspaper at the beginning of the story about um some uh psycho basically who's just escaped from um, an institution um, 
who goes by the name of the misfit and she says that uh, the misfit is a loose and I just love the work that she manages to get um, the word a loose to do. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, so, uh, you know, a letter writer would take maybe two or three sentences um, dropping cheese at the end of, you know, ing words all over the place um, and writing some really clumsy and sort of patronising vernacular um, to show us that this woman is, um, she's a simple kind of country woman. She's not very well educated um, and she sort of has notions. Um, and I just think that the word a loose does the work of um, very many words um, there and I really love it. Um, another writer who I think, uh, another American writer actually, who I think is brilliant um, at writing dialogue um, and um, is Annie Prue. And um, the example that I'm going to read you is from her story Brokeback Mountain. So it's the scene where um, Jack and Ennis haven't seen each other for four years and Jack um, comes and knocks on the door of the apartment that Ennis lives in with his wife and children. And um, so it's a very long sentence and the dialogue comes at the very end. Um, and um, I'm going to try and do my best to read it. It'll probably sound much better um, being met by somebody with an American accent, but you've just got me today. They seized each other by the shoulders hugged mightily, squeezing the breath out of each other, saying, son of a bitch, son of a bitch, then, and easily as the ripe key turned the lock tumblers. Their mouths came together, and hard, Jack's big teeth bringing blood, his hat falling to the floor, stubble rasping, wet saliva welling, and the door opening, and Alma looking out for a few seconds at Ennis's straining shoulders, and shutting the door again, and still they clinched, pressing chest and groin and thigh and leg together, treading on each other's toes until they pulled apart to breathe and Ennis, not big on endearments, said what he said to his horses and daughters. Little darling. Um, I think uh, every time I read that passage, I burst into tears at the end. So um, I've, I've read it a couple of times today and obviously cried myself out, so I didn't cry that time. Um, but uh, I mean, I guess... Um, there's something about the way that she uses it um, at, at the very end. So we've had this very, you know, very sort of heightened emotional descriptive passage telling us about the sort of physical stuff that's going on. Um, and, 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 and I suppose really because the story is about two men who just um, who, who don't have the vocabulary or anything to deal with um, with, with what they're feeling and what's happening to them. Um, I just think um, that those words at the end, that little darling, is absolutely heartbreaking and, um, and really beautiful. Um, so then another story that I was thinking about um, is another American writer and it's a very short story, well, a pretty short story um, and it's by um, uh, Tobias Wolf, and it's called Bullet in the Brain, another very famous story and um, Bullet in the Brain is about a very uh, cynical literary critic who um, goes to the bank and he is standing in a bank queue when some raiders come in to hold the place up. And um, the raiders are masked and all you can see, I mean, there's certainly one of the robbers who comes quite close to him and you can see his sort of pink eyes and but he's a wee bit jumpy. And um, but uh, so this man in the in the queue uh, begins to take exception to the way that the um, that one of the raiders is speaking, you know, it's this very sort of gangster language and um, he starts to basically take the piss out of him. And, um, so this conversation conversation kind of ensues where um you know the the bank robber is talking like a bank robber and then this guy is is, is um you know um just you know terribly cynical and speaking like not quite like a literary critic and um, but anyway the inevitable happens he basically is warned to keep quiet and um, he goes too far and he ends up getting shot um i'm not really giving anything away because it is called bullet in the brain um but the very, the, the, it, it, the, the last scene, I mean, it goes on for probably more than a page. Um, um, it describes, you know, in a very sort of forensic way, what happens as the bullet travels through um, this man's brain um, and how it takes with it this, you know, this trail of memories and stuff. Um, and the story ends on, uh, it, so it goes all through his life and all these things that you'd imagine that he would remember, all these significant things that he would remember. Um, 
but actually um, it, it lands on, I actually don't want to give it away, um, but it just lands on a place where it, um, uh, it, it, it's not a, it lands in a place where um, um, we see this man uh, before he became cynical, before his relationship with language became jaded. Uh, recall in a baseball match where this child who wasn't educated at all said something. Um, so you have to read it for yourselves to um, to 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 get it. But anyway, um, I really love that story, um, and I really recommend that you read it. Um, the other story uh, that I was thinking about, um, and it's it's not just about what the characters say. Um, there there's a lot of possibility in the gaps in between. Um, in between uh, lines of dialogue and a writer who I think is fantastic um, at, at using those spaces is Sally Rooney. So she does it fabulously in um, in her novels. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, very often when you're writing prose, and I have to really work on this myself, um, that it's very tempting to say, oh, he looked out the window or he picked up a drink and drank a bit or, um, or she nodded. Uh, so, you know, instead of having people nodding all over the place, um, that you know with with work and with care and um, those those gaps in between can be used very effectively so i'm gonna um read an excerpt from one of sally's stories um called mr salary and um, it's one of my favorite short stories and um, so this story is about a young woman who lives in um uh, a, a young woman who who's been living abroad and she returns to dublin uh, to be with her dying father and she's picked up at the airport by an older man who she has like sort of previous with. Um, so um, I suppose the bit that I think is done so well is that, um, you know, these people, they've clearly been in touch while she's been away and um, and they do have a, 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 a past. Um, but I think the, the bit that I love is how Rooney really ramps up the sexual tension. Um, in the lines in between. Uh, so I'm going to read you a bit. You look unbelievably good, I said. You look better than the last time I saw you even. I thought I was in decline by now, age-wise. You look okay, but you're young, so. What are you doing, yoga or something? I've been running, he said. The car's just out here. Outside it was below zero and a thin rim of frost formed on the corners of Nathan's windshield. The interior of his car smelled like air freshener and the brand of aftershave he liked to wear to events. I didn't know what the aftershave was called but I knew what the bottle looked like. I saw it in drugstores sometimes and if I was having a bad day I let myself screw the cap off. My hair feels physically unclean, I said not just unwashed, but actively dirty. Nathan closed the door and put the keys in the ignition. The dash lit up in soft Scandinavian colours. You don't have any news you've been waiting to tell me in person, do you? He said. Do people do that? You don't have like a secret tattoo or anything. I would have attached it in a JPEG, JPEG I said. Believe me. He was reversing out of the parking space and onto this ne the neat lit avenue leading to the exit. I pulled my feet up onto the passenger seat so that I could hug my knees against my chest uncomfortably. Why, I said, do you have news? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, I guess we should finish up, but, ju but just actually before I do finish, um, there's a lot of advice out there. Like um, when I was preparing to talk to you, I uh, did some Google searches and I pulled, I mean, if you if you had the time, um, you could read like thousands of articles about um, how to write dialogue in, in short stories. You know, if you do a Google search, and I think that that's all very well. Um, um, but really you learn from, I really think you learn from um, from writing. Uh, from reading and from and from listening. And there's a lot of conventional wisdom that I think you probably ought to ignore ignore um you know or maybe you know that saying there's something about you know knowing the rules to to break them or whatever um so um i would say just um uh you know um like we're told to keep um the dialogue in short stories really clipped 
and um and smart and clean and that's fine but then you know a completely amazing short story is where people are just rambling on and they're all plastered and it's um what we talk about when we talk about love by Raymond Carver um so I suppose all I'm trying to say is um it's just you know really do what do what works for the story that you're trying to tell and have a bit of crack with it and listen and um yeah thank you very much hope this is helpful thanks <laughs>